Hello and welcome to this masterclass. Our topic today is the forage garden. My name is Morag Gamble. I'm from the Permaculture Education Institute. So I'd like to warmly welcome you to this session. Uh, I'd like to welcome those of you who are part of the Permaculture Educators Program. This is one of the regular masterclasses that uh, is part of your program. I'd also like to welcome everyone who's registered from around the world. There was around 3,000 people registered for this session. So thank you so much for being here. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm meeting with you today, uh, the land of the Gubby Gubby people. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge the land on which I'm originally from, which is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and to acknowledge too that this land was never ceded. So those of you who are joining live now, I invite you to open up the chat and introduce yourself, where you're from, and uh, use that space as a uh, somewhere to ask questions and to engage in conversation throughout this whole session. If you're watching this as a recording, then also please feel free to pop in questions and comments and discussion uh, down below. So I'm so happy that you're here and uh, it's a topic that I absolutely love. This session today is part of a series of online masterclasses I've been running for quite some time now, exploring everything from kitchen gardening to the ethics, to the response of permaculture, to the bushfires, to permaculture and the sustainable development goals, looking after a soil, setting up food forest. There is an enormous amount of wealth in these masterclasses and I welcome you to dive into those. Uh, I'll put a link in the chat where you can find these. So forage garden, what is that? Well, I think of a forage garden as being essentially a permaculture veggie garden. It's a place that is based on nature, based on the ecological principles it's really a simple way of gardening that gives us an abundance of food with much less time involved. It's a way that replicates how nature works uh, and creates a balanced ecological system. A little bit like a food forest is for the orchard area, the forage garden is how we can describe a, a permaculture vegetable garden. And it's a beautiful place that we can explore, you know, what is there available today that I can eat as we head out into our gardens to explore, you know, what are what are some of the fruits or the vegetables, the leafy greens, even the weeds and explore all the possibilities in all the different seasons. I love the idea of surrounding our homes with forage gardens and creating luscious, abundant spaces uh, that are biodiverse, that are basically garden ecosystems where we become the foragers. And I love to be able to also share these spaces with so many people to explore the beauty of this and the possibilities and to, and to help open up the potential to see nature as teacher and uh, to see long-term solutions for our food needs. And in a forage garden, it's actually really fascinating. I've been doing this for such a long time now. And honestly, I can absolutely testify to this, that I get more food each year with less work. And the abundance just keeps on emerging. It changes every year, uh, depending on the season. But the resilience of the system now is so strong because of the principles that underpin this. I mean, essentially... A forage garden is a permaculture garden and all of those ecological principles are embedded there. So my recent inspiration for exploring this term of the forage garden it comes from, uh, from reviewing this lovely book from Permanent Publications, the, the organisation that also produces the permaculture magazine in the UK. And uh, so... This idea of describing a permaculture garden as a forager's garden or a forage garden, I think is just beautiful. So this is a sort of the recent inspiration for using this term for it. And I'm really ex loving the opportunity to explore uh, this new language in the way that we describe a permaculture garden. I think it's really beautiful. So we have forage garden, forest garden, food forest. In, and then there's also um, indigenous food systems that are also a, a deep inspiration, like the sacred groves in India and the uh, indigenous landscapes here in Australia. 
One of the things that I really enjoy about the forage garden is its simplicity, that it really helps to fit within a busy life that, like I said before, that you can get more food with less work and that it's absolutely a low maintenance garden. This is my daughter from when she was quite young. In some of the early days of our forage garden, you can see surrounding her, she has perennials and flowers, um, there's annuals, self-seeding vegetables, um, and all of that is edible. The flowers are edible, the, the seeds are edible, the, the leaves are edible, there's edible roots. And this garden just keeps on creating an absolute beautiful abundance. So growing food in this way of gardening just is, a, is elegant simplicity. And it also gives me a great sense of security because there's always something to eat. And so this builds in a deep sense of, of security and resilience. And you can see here that there's just all different kinds of greens and fruits and vegetables. I just go out and forage and see what I can find and just pick off the ends of different things and come inside. It could be a salad or a stir fry or a frittata or it can go into a soup. All different sorts of things that can be created from that and it's local food as well so this means that you know there's always something to eat and I'm also reducing my ecological footprint at the same time as well as having food that comes from the land in which I'm dwelling and has the nutrients so far more active than if it's been transported a long distance and I love the beauty of having a, a garden that's surrounded that's full of flowers and colors and scents and textures nature is just so amazing just even the vegetable flowers like what i gather here in these little jars and i bring them inside and and put them around the house what and it's different every day and you know the thing about these sorts of bouquets as well is that they're edible so you in the if you have them in the middle of the table you can just kind of like pluck off some and add them on top of your salad as well so as well as beautiful, it's it's medicinal. There's so many different foods and uh, herbs and spices that are within the garden that uh, bring health and well-being. And so some of these can be made into um, medicinal tonics or medicinal foods, or it is just the fact that you're eating such brilliant, healthy, local food all the time that brings health and well-being. And part of that well-being comes from it being just a peaceful way of gardening. I don't feel that I need to fight with my garden. I am very much working with the plants, with the soil, with the soil organisms and with the wildlife too. So I find it a very peaceful way of gardening. And I think part of the way of thinking it as, as a peaceful way of gardening is that I recognise that the garden is a community. And that the plants all are part of this community and I'm a part of that community as well. As well as the bees and the lizards and the frogs and the kangaroos and the, all, of, all of the different species that dwell within this landscape as well as the plants as well as the soil organisms are part of this community which expands so dramatically the concept of companion planting whereas one to one it is that the whole system, it's a living system, it's absolutely beautiful. So a living system based on the principles of nature and really underpinned by the soil food web. So within that community, there's this dynamic fluid nature. Everything's changing all the time. So you may have some fixed uh, aspects of it, like the fruit trees, like the mandarin here. But surrounding that, there'll be things that are changing in the different seasons and they'll come and go. So there could be the annuals like the chia in the foreground here. Yeah, that, that is the chia that you can sprinkle on your on your um, cereal in the morning. You just take some of those black seeds and sprinkle about in your garden and they'll grow like this. You can then take the, uh, the leaves and use them in, in salad or cooking and wait until the little flower heads mature and you can um, tap out and get your own seeds back, which you can either put back in the garden or take back to your cereal. Uh, there's also things like the Vietnamese mint, which is just off onto the left corner, which when it's in its the warm, wet season for me, that will, will uh, spread out and be more of a ground cover. And then when it gets cooler and dry, it retreats and something else will come up. 
Then there's the comfrey that's tucked in behind and that's kind of there bringing up deep nutrients and, and providing chop and drop. And all of these things shift and change. And so when something dies back, it creates a space for something else to come up. Um, then something else might come through and, and take over that spot. And, and this dynamic interplay happens. And what I notice over time is that it does find its balance. And it's absolutely amazing just being part of this and noticing what's happening. So what is essential about helping to cultivate a forage garden? So the basis of it all is starting with the soil. The soil, once we start to create a living and healthy soil, this becomes a foundation for everything else to flourish. And you know, it does take time for it to, to create this beautiful structure and aliveness. And what you notice over time as you develop it, as I said before, that you start to get more abundance and less work. But most of the work that I have put into my garden over the years has been in helping to feed the soil. Rather than feeding the plants, I feed the soil and then the soil nourishes the plant community. So at the core of this and at the core of a, of a beautiful forage garden is this foraging web of life. Now let me tell you a little bit about this because a bit of understanding about what's going on here is going to be so useful for helping to create the level of uh, resilience in your forage garden that you need. So essentially uh, this is this is mycelium. So mycelium is a branching it's the branching type of hyphae. These are the little threads that you see um, of any fungus and they are ceaselessly exploring and foraging and digesting. They're, they'll send out these threads in every direction, sprawling out this interlacing web that, that is like the ecological connective tissue. And it goes um, through the soil, it goes down below the ocean, it goes along reefs, through plants, through animal bodies, alive and dead. It's, it's everywhere. Like I said, it's the ecological connective tissue. And in one teaspoon of soil, what you might find is actually up to 10 kilometers, 10 kilometers in one teaspoon of single cell thick hyphae. This is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And what happens is this foraging web of life as it's going out is like kind of like a swarm, a swarm of hyphae ends. They're like they have the little little tips at the end. They're just swarming out like a, like insects, like ants, like a, a murmuration of, of swallows. And it's one single entity. It's interconnected. And it's digesting as it goes. It doesn't kind of go and collect it and bring it back and digest it. As it goes, it digests and it keeps moving and shifting and changing. Now, why is this important for a forage garden? Well, the thing is that essentially that most plants in the world absolutely rely on a relationship with the fungus, which is um, this is called the mycorrhizal fungus. Uh, this is the micro, so the mica comes from the the fungus and the rhizal comes from the root. So it's this symbiotic relationship between the roots and the fungus. Now this is important to know because essentially, uh, as I said, most plants rely on this in order to get the nutrients and the moisture that they need and the minerals from deeper and further into the soil than the roots are capable of. The mycorrhizal fungi, they're, they're the foragers of the soil. They're 50 times finer. They're 100 times longer than the roots are. And in actual fact, this relationship between the fungus and the roots is 460 million years old. So there's this trading between the moisture and the minerals for the sunlight and the carbs. And basically, it's this relationship that helps plants to deal with drought, with heat, with stress, they make the plants healthier. They make the plants more nutritious. They are so prolific, in fact, that they make up 50% of the living mass in the soil. And if you add up the length of all these hyphae threads that are in the top 10 centimeters of the soil, you would be able to stretch halfway across our galaxy. They are so prolific. 
And what they do is they unpack the nutrients of rocks and they help to decompose matter and they mine phosphorus. And basically, they have this dual life. So they live part of their life in the soil and they live part of their life in a plant. Now, this is really interesting because then you start to think, well, actually, where does the plant end and the fungus begin? That it, You really can't separate them. They are one and the same. And so it's important that we understand that this is the key for healthy plants and a healthy garden. And by taking care of our garden in a way that creates the conditions for this, our gardens are going to thrive and we're going to thrive as a result. So my mycorrhizal fungi matters um, and it's this relationship that matters. And it's interesting too to, that a lot of experiments have been done to look at well, what are the different types of mycorrhizal relationships that are there and the ones that have the healthier relationships or actually more of a relationship in soils that are alive they have better taste um, better flavor intensity the texture even of the the foods are different they did this study of wheat that was grown with a healthy mycorrhizal um, a healthy mycorrhizae in the soil as opposed to ones that were grown in a chemical um, non-mycorrhizal environment and they got some taste testers who have a long experience of, of tasting the difference. And even after the, the wheat was ground and baked and risen and all the different things that happens to that wheat, the tasters noticed the difference, the flavor intensity, the texture of the bread even. And then studies have been done too to show that the nutritional value of food that comes from plants that are grown with this relationship is much higher. And that for, therefore also means that it has a much greater medicinal quality. Uh, so this matters. This really does matter. And the reason I'm telling you this is because a forage garden, the way that forage gardens are set up and developed and maintained, supports the mycorrhizal fungi to thrive. And I really wanted you uh, to let you know about this book uh, by Merlin Sheldrake. I absolutely love his name too. Uh, this book is a wonderful book that explains um, this whole process. So Entangled Life, how fungi, how fungi make our worlds, shape our minds and shape our futures. So I highly recommend you take a look at this book. Now, so how do we tend to the essentials for a forage garden? How do we tend to the essentials of looking after the mycorrhizal fungi? Well, if you think about what fungus needs to thrive well it needs moisture it needs some sort of food and it needs to be protected from the elements because if it gets too much sun it bakes and it gets too hot and it dries out um, and if it has no food for it to actually um, feed off or to to thrive within then it's also going to die back so that's part of it but the other part is having minimal disturbance because you imagine all these threads that are all connected and heading off in different directions if we start to chop those up then they also lose their effectiveness because essentially they're root extenders and connectors between plants as well uh, another thing that's really important to keep in mind too is is uh, getting getting rid of using fertilizers and pesticides which are going to damage it as well so um, chemicals intense sun and drying out and a lack of food in the soil is going to um, make it conditions that it won't thrive so we want to be tending to creating the essential environment that this will thrive and the first one of those is about rehydrating the landscape so one of this with my wonderful um, volunteer in the garden and I'm so sad that I don't get much of a chance to have volunteers in my garden these days because of of COVID uh, we used to have people from all around the world coming and working with us in the garden so this was one of our um, volunteers from Japan and she's there um, helping to add in compost into the gardens but what I'm what I wanted to show you with this particular picture is the structure of the garden. So I designed the garden particularly so that it harvested any rainwater that fell. So the pathway is along the contour and as 
any water falls down, it falls on there, it gets distributed along the contour pathway and soaked into each of these terraces. Uh, so in my garden, I'm on a little bit of a slope. So that gives me the chance to collect. So to sort of um, slow it, spread it, sink it and store it. So the the garden is designed to harvest the moisture and sink it in. And then the plants and the structure and the way that the whole garden is designed will collect and direct it to where it's meant to go. Now, this is quite different from a whole series of raised garden beds where you actually have to put the water up into those places. This is collecting water that, that falls, but then also helping to create small water cycles. So with all the shrubs and the plants that are collecting moisture and creating um, a habitat and helping to prevent things from getting dehydrated, there's a little bit of shade there, a lot of mulch materials, and the gardens that are, that are lower down that prevents them from drying out, and bigger beds too. The bigger beds, I think, is a really important um, thing to think about. Often we, we design vegetable gardens with lots of small beds. Uh, actually, if we create long beds, big, long, wide beds with little keyhole pathways into them, for example, then what's happening is underground, the community, that soil life community, is able to extend and connect every single one of those plants. And the interesting thing about this is that if one plant starts to get eaten by something, it will send out a message through this internet of the underground to let all the other plants know. And also if one plant is really thriving in one spot, it can redistribute nutrients from one section to another. So this bigger bed not only helps me to manage my water, it helps me to also um, create this thriving and alive system that is throughout this whole section and creating as much diversity as possible is also another part of it so this gives me the chance to have you know like absolutely outrageous diversity really that's part of rewilding the system and finding niches every time I find a little gap I might um, put something extra in that's particularly when I'm getting when I'm getting the system started what I'm finding now is if, if something, you know, dies back, it's an annual, the system itself will find something to replace it with. And every now and then I might clear a little section um, just so that I can put some extra things in that I think, you know, that are missing or some annual that I'd really like to have this season. But essentially there's an ecological balance now that provides a variety of food and teas and um, fruits and roots and vegetables and medicinals. And the key part of this is actually protecting the soil life. So the, the fact of mulching and having uh, cover from the, the many different sorts of shrubs or, or even things that you can see in the background of this picture, there's a mustard green. Now the mustard greens come up and self-seed. What I like about that is that they're actually helping to create an extra cover. So they provide... Um, more sort of sun protection and keeping keeping the soil alive underneath it's much better to have things growing even if it's if you're not going to particularly eat that because I get so many of them coming up I can't eat them all but I know that they're helping to activate the soil below so it's better to leave them in than to keep taking them out and have a blank spot so uh, living mulch or hay mulch depending on what stage you're at in your garden and like I said before, I often create little areas. If I've finished, if something's finished, I might make a little niche there that I can put some extra things in. And what I do instead of digging it, what I will do is actually add things on top. So some extra compost perhaps that I've been preparing um, from, the, from the chickens and that will just go on top of this and then some more mulch on top. And you'll notice too that I've actually not completely emptied the whole area. And so this idea of no dig is really about an idea of least disturbance and of, about maintaining enough roots with, within the garden itself so that they will have these the mycorrhizae um, attached. And as soon as the, the disturbance is finished, they will re-inhabit that. So it's interesting to see how quickly that whole section will come back to life much more than if I just completely emptied a bed 
and then started from scratch again. So uh, the least disturbance method of gardening I find helps me to get um, so much more abundance so much more quickly. Now so the idea of um, protecting the soil life, so protecting it with shrubs, protecting it with mulch, protecting it with small plants that are covering it, and also then feeding the soil. So I have a series of different ways that I do that, um, that are integrated throughout. And some of that might be just by having plants that are shedding their leaves and dropping them back. Um, I have movable bins throughout the garden. so. Uh, where I see that there's somewhere that needs a little bit more attention, I'll put the compost bin there, fill, fill it up, and when it's ready, I'll just lift off the bin, spread out that material, and mulch over the top. And so all of the activation that's happening in that area um, just stays there. It's not being removed and taken somewhere else. And then I'll move the bin uh, to the next spot that I think needs some help. And then I also have scattered throughout the side a series of worm towers, which I can just um, just feed some of the main areas of the garden directly and there's worm uh, compost worms in those and then other soil organisms come into that and take out the the nutrients further um, also have a few little other worm farms tucked around in the garden in the shade where we can access the liquid materials or even some of the the castings which we can use in our propagation so there's all different sorts of nutrients that are there to help bring bring that soil alive and to keep feeding the soil. And of course, lots of materials that can be chopped and dropped. So comfrey is one of the main players in my garden that I use to, to just constantly grow my own mulch and material for composting and to be dropping in and around the fruit trees or tucked underneath some mulch somewhere. Another, another strategy I use too is thinking about when a crop has finished, not to pull the whole thing and throw it away but actually to leave the roots in so for example if some uh, some crop is finished I might snip off the top and actually leave the stump in the ground so as that rots back down it's feeding the soil because if you sort of do constantly planting and pulling planting and pulling it's sort of like a mining extraction what you want is to actually be constantly regenerating the soil and feeding the soil so every time that you're planting and you're harvesting, that you're actually putting something back into the soil as well. And often what I do is I just might poke a few things in through the midst of that. So, you know, there might be some corn going to come out of that next or some broad beans. You can just poke the seeds in through those things. Or otherwise, as you can see here, the sweet potatoes are just starting to come back across where the pumpkins have finished. And there's a cranberry hibiscus that's um, a cutting that can just be put in there and it will take off. So the planting, how does the planting work in this type of forage garden? How do you start to set it up and think about getting a living system like this happening, a community of plants? Well, the key thing really is to think about layers. And it's very much like a food forest type of concept, but it's in your veggie garden. So you can see here there's there's the the upper layers of fruit trees, uh, there's vines, then there's shrubs, there's lower like vegetable layers, there'll be root crops, all different layers within the garden. And it provides a balanced ecosystem that prov produces an abundance of food in all these different niches. So having trees in a veggie garden is something that's not, not, not kind of what you normally would expect to see. And it, it it requires you to actually think a little bit differently about the types of trees that you might include. So maybe you pick um, dwarf fruit trees or if you're putting in something that's a little bit larger, perhaps like a mulberry, to think about how you can keep it trimmed and keep it small. And in that way too, you're going to probably get more fruit because, you know, the fruit that's right up the top tends to be the stuff that gets eaten by the birds instead of you. So just keep it nice and low and small. Or you could maybe make a, you know, a pomegranate hedge. Uh, I've got a pomegranate that's just growing straight out the front of my um, veranda next to the lemon myrtle tree. Both the lemon myrtle and the pomegranate I keep really nice and small. And, you know, I'm only just starting to get some pomegranates on it now. It's a, it's a newer plant. Um, they weren't superb fruit this year. But the thing is, this particular tree, you can also eat the leaves of it. So the young leaves are really beautiful to eat and it creates 
this really nice western screen that protects the soil uh, from the harsh sun and also from the wind. So I'm using the pomegranate for many different functions. It's a little bit like how I use um, fast growing leguminous shrubs, kind of like things like the pigeon pea. So it's a short lived shrub that uh, helps to fix nitrogen in the soil. It also grows lots of uh, soft leaves that you can be chopping and dropping and, and keeping it nice and small so that materials are going back into the soil. Um, and then you can either eat the peas, you can just see them starting to form there when they're young, but mostly people wait until they're dry, like rattle pods on the, on the actual bush itself, and then collect those. And it's pigeon pea that's something that's been used uh, for well over 3,000 years in India as, as a dal ingredient. So you can get many different, so you, you know, instead of growing peas or beans, you can grow a shrub. It's perennial. It grows for, you know, four or five years. So instead of having to sort of plant and pull all the time, you just maintain one plant in an area that has all these multiple functions and benefits for the soil, um, as well as producing a huge amount of food because it's, it's much bigger than what you can get off one little vine. Now, other types of perennials too that you might want to consider are things like this, which is the cranberry hibiscus. Um, I use the leaves of this as a spinach alternative. So instead of having a crop of a whole lot of spinaches, um, you can just grow a couple of shrubs and you've got this abundance of, I was going to say leafy greens, they're not green obviously, but it's used in that same way. So these can be used in as any way that you would use a spinach, cook them up in a spanakopita, toss them in a stir fry, um, make them in, a, in any kind of bake, absolutely brilliant. Uh, and also then there's things, other leafy green plants and um, that are absolutely robust. These are the sorts of plants that I know that regardless of what the season is, these plants will just thrive. This is why cassava is such an important plant in many parts of the world um, when they're, where they're struggling with drought or, or you know, in, in fertile soils. Um, this plant, cassava, is absolutely amazing it produces an abundance of greens um, you've got to cook cassava otherwise it has um, toxins within it, within its um, leaves and its roots but as soon as it's cooked they've they've dissipated so the leaves of this can be used as a cooked green as well as the roots so I always encourage people within a forage garden to incorporate a lot of these types of plants so there could be edible cannas there's cassavas um, taros plants which you may not necessarily eat all of them because you know there's just so much abundance of it but if if there was a really dry season or the you know the the, the rains just didn't come and everything else just kind of fell away you would still have this food and so i think thinking about the extremes what are the types of extremes like if something's really wet some things will just die back they'll get mold uh, so what are the things which survive well in that? What are the things which survive well in drought? And make sure you have a spectrum of different sorts of foods that you know are robust for all of those different conditions. Now what I find too is that typically the plants which are more perennial plants that have the deeper root systems that are connected to these hyphae which are the mycelium network which is going out collecting nutrients and moisture from far deeper and further than the plants ever could on their own also helps to create this robustness and the the more perennial the system is the more robust your system is and this is just such a revelation for so many um, gardeners when you realize how much abundance you can get simply by growing more perennial edibles as opposed to the the annual garden beds with the typical vegetables that we're accustomed to growing uh, so some other ones that you might want to think about to um, um, ground cover so we're still talking about our different layers of the food here so uh, at the ground cover level one of those might be sweet potato so sweet potato gives you the chance of of having multiple crops as well like the cassava so the sweet potato, you can be constantly harvesting the leaves and these young leaves particularly I love. The nice, young, juicy ones you can just snip off the ends of those. 
interestingly, the more that you snip off these young little ends, the more that they'll come. And so actually by going around and just being the forager, snipping a bit here and a bit there, um, tidies up your garden and helps to get more food. So the more you eat, actually, the more you end up getting, which is, you know, often people say, well, how much food do you get out of your garden? Honestly, I, I, I've i stopped counting because it's really hard to measure. It's not it's not the plant and pull and weigh and measure and and send off site or, you know, it's it just is the more that, like I said, the more that I harvest, the more that comes and the more snippings, cuttings I take off and give away, the more shoots I'll get. It's it's a you know, it's really hard to kind of measure uh, a perennial forage garden in that in that sort of quantified way. Anyway, as well as the leaves, you've also obviously got the root zone too. So you've got all of the sweet potato roots. And what I do, instead of kind of clearing out the whole area and digging the whole thing up, I'll just bandicoot. And you kind of get down, you just gently pull away some of the sweet potato leaves until you find a spot where the where the where all the stalks are going. You know there's going to be a root there. Or when or where a stalks come down and touch the ground and it's really quite firm, you know there's going to be a root there too. So you just kind of what we call bandicoot around and you'll find them. And that way you don't have to destroy or disturb the whole plant. Again, it's that that concept of least disturbance. Again, a, a peaceful way of gardening so that the plant can continue to thrive and continue to be part of the system and continue to produce food for you. And And there's so many different kind of root crops that you can include. Um, So many weird and wonderful things as well as the standard ones like the potatoes and the sweet potatoes and the taros and the cassavas. This one here is yacon, otherwise known as Peruvian ground apple. Now this big long uh, brown root here that you can see is a very deceptive thing. It's actually very sweet like an apple, which is why, you know, it's often... um, well, it's called the ground apple. So you can just peel it and slice it and eat it fresh. One thing that's really nice to do with that is just to to peel it and slice it kind of like you would a, a cucumber and just use it as like a little dip biscuit. Um, the These crowns here that you see, you can snap those off and then take those and use those to plant again. Uh, or you can eat those as well. They're really nice and crispy. So I appreciate Yacon in my particular environment because it's something that is a, such an easy, non-fussy type of sweet plant that I can grow. And I can't grow apples here because I don't get enough chill. So this is a great one for me. Uh, now you might want to think about how you can integrate the, the vine layer into your garden. So maybe it's up the side of your house or up the side of a shed or on a fence or over a trellis where you have a nice seat underneath. There's so many different amazing um, vines that you can grow to, you know, from climbing tomatoes to climbing cucumbers and climbing gourds and passion fruits and beans and peas. Um, Here in, in my environment, I really love the things like snake beans because they give me enormously long beans in huge quantities. And so I only need a few of those Um, just going up the side of a fence on the edge of my garden and I just have a huge amount. Um, Also things like Madagascar beans which are big lemur beans, spotted ones and and they last for about seven years as well. With the snake beans too I always just leave a few to go back into the soil and what that means is that, that when the environment is right again, so when it gets warm enough, uh, these snake beans will just start to sprout up again from that spot. So I don't need to keep planting all the time. So I just very carefully think about that the next generation of the plants. And, um, you know, if I if I forget, they remember anyway. So um, I, I really, like I said, I really can step back so much from that now. Really what I have to do is manage the abundance. So we went away for a few weeks um, last Christmas uh, to go and visit my family. And we came back and the the pumpkins were like Triffids almost taking over our house. So we we just kind of came back and trimmed this all back and took that back into the, you know, as mulch in the garden. And we also ate a lot of it because all the leaves uh, make beautiful um, 
wraps. You can just steam up the leaves and they make a beautiful wrap. You can put some rice and vegetables in and, and eat that up. And you can just even take these young leaves and shoots and chop them up and add them into any kind of sort of dish that you would use a spinach in. You kind of think about pumpkins having prickles that are not going to be nice to eat. But actually, as soon as you start to cook them up, that goes um, as well. The other thing that I'd like to encourage you to think about is how plants are over time. And, you know, staying on the pumpkin example. So in the first instance, when the pumpkin starts to sprout, you can actually eat that right then and there. That's a beautiful green. So if you see a pumpkin coming up in a spot that you don't want, simply take it and uh, toss it into your next salad or stir fry. It's wonderful. Then as it starts to grow and you saw all those leaves, you can be snipping those off and eating from that. And then you get to a certain point and you've got those tendrils coming off. And I what happened was as I was snipping back all those pumpkin vines that were taking over the house, I came across a lot of these little pumpkins. Now, they're edible too. Because if you think about how you eat a zucchini, you off, you eat a zucchini when it's young, not as it's a big marrow. You, you do that as well, but mostly we pick them as as immature it's the same family you can entirely eat them as immature and in actual fact they're very much like a zucchini when you eat them at that time so i just slice them up nice and finely and toss them into a stir fry you can also eat the flowers so all of that is edible as well as um, you know you wash off the pumpkin you can eat the skin of that you can eat the seeds of it Um, every single part of the pumpkin is edible so if you think about how you can eat different parts of your plants over time. And you can apply the same thinking to pretty much all of the plants that you have in your garden. And it's that, that revelation in in itself transforms the way that you engage with your plants and with your garden and shifts how you see how much abundance you have. And uh, valuing to the self-seeded plants. This is one of those mustard greens I was mentioning before, but this is one of the red mustard spinach that produces massive great leaves. This is my my daughter standing beside, just to give you a sense of the scale. These leaves are enormous. Just one of those leaves is almost more than enough that you can have for a stir fry. So we just keep taking a leaf off that one one day and a leaf off another one another day so that each one is not harmed. Uh, that you can just keep coming back around for the entire life of this plant. You just keep taking the edge leaves off. And these, this is again the mustard spinach, that um, leaving those to go to seed, as well as many of the other plants um, and vegetables throughout your garden, to have things flowering all the time, provides an enormous amount of, of pollinator food. Um, and you can eat these little flowers as well. Pretty much all of the... The flowers from vegetables are edible and I think it's you know they add such an amazing flavor and particularly these brassicas that just add beautiful flavor into into salads you can also eat uh, the flowers off the perennial basils and these produce uh, beautiful uh, habitat for for bees uh, they mostly all the time just buzzing they are such brilliant food for the pollinators and you get all sorts of things coming into your garden all different sorts of wildlife and as I mentioned before frogs and lizards um, little birds big birds I don't know what he was trying to do here this king parrot because he definitely wasn't hiding and he doesn't eat these sorts of um, he doesn't eat calendula either so I was kind of curious that he was there but anyway um what I notice is that over time, as the garden gets more developed, that there are more creatures in there that help to manage anything that comes across as pests. So, uh, you know, the the lizards and the little birds and all those things come in and they're insectivorous and they help so much. And, uh, and it's such a, a beautiful thing having the flowers in the garden as well because not only does it do all of those ecological services um, but you can also, um, particularly with things like calendula, you can harvest those and use them to make your own salves. You know, I really see that as part of the way of, of trying to get rid of the extra plastics and packaging that exists in our lives but also bringing things back to just recognising what's in the garden and how we can just base our lives 
mostly from what's around us if we can. Another thing that I love about a a garden like this, a forage garden, is that I can let my chickens free range in and amongst it far more freely. So when you have mostly annuals, it they can be devastated by having the chickens roaming through them. But when I have far more perennials and hardy greens, you know, the chickens might come around, they'll grab a bit off the edge of the sorrel, but that's just kind of trimming it and the sorrel will keep growing and they don't touch the leeks and they only get a bit of the kale. That's okay. Um, so, you know, the chickens can actually be part of it and they can help with that pest management as well. So I really like that because it helps me to keep a more healthy flock of chickens because the chickens are out collecting bugs and scratching through and picking up all different sorts of greens and seeds and, and keeping much more healthier that way. So a forage garden is so supportive of of us of wild animals and also the animals that we choose to keep and also the ones that come and visit so um i i often get well pretty much every day i have kangaroos in my garden this is a kangaroo mother and uh she she lives in my garden with her joeys she's been coming for a couple of years now and i you get to know each of the kangaroos i've been living in this place for over 20 years now and and I get to know each of the families that comes through. And I used to be a little bit worried when I first came here that the kangaroos would actually eat my garden. And what I've noticed over time is that the kangaroos just eat the grass around the edges. So they're doing me a favor. So what I've actually done is to design the garden in a way that just and they, it, it guides the kangaroos through the gate they come into the garden and they keep on moving down the hill and out a gate at the bottom. So I've designed the garden to facilitate the flow of movement of kangaroos through the garden and past the areas that I want them to maintain. And we have this beautiful relationship. So I wonder what are the ways that we can also work with other wildlife to think about how they can be part of this forage garden system as well. Essentially, a forage garden is about working with nature. So looking at how we can um, identify what is the, the local ecological system, what is it about how nature works in our local area that can inform how we design our gardens. So how it is for me is going to be different from how it is for you because your local natural system works differently. So go out and have a look at what's going on, what, what's happening in the seasons, what's happening in the local bushland area, what are the different kind of layers that you see, what's the intensity of your sun. You think of, look at the spaciousness of the local air, local bushland areas. Um, what are the how many different sort of layers can you identify? What are the sorts of species that are growing below that are coming through, and then start to replicate what you see in nature in your garden. Nature is always the best teacher in terms of helping us to become um, great designers. So I encourage you to become a forager in your garden. Bring the foraging idea into, into your own spaces in and around where you are. And then think too about what's happening beyond your boundaries. You know, are there bushland areas where you can forage uh, for some berries or some nuts and things that or, you know, where I live, um, I can go for wonders. I know where the, the lily pillies are. I know where the, the native figs along the river are. And I know where all these different trees are. I've, I've pegged them all. And I actually consider them part of my broader garden because they're part of my broader landscape. And so I mostly focus on what's in my garden, but I also know that there's this whole world of food out and around in my neighborhood. And I know which ones are safe to eat, which ones are the ones that are not being um, peed on by dogs or sprayed by someone and, and being really aware of, of the conditions in the environment and supporting uh, those to be as abundant as possible in my own garden. Now, what I wanted to mention here, too, is that this idea that I keep talking about is a little just foraging a little bit here and a little bit there rather than going to one particular plant and going, great, okay, so there's that plan. I'll just take everything from that one today. And then next day I'll come and get all from that one. 
I really encourage you to sort of step back and go, okay, just a little bit from that plant, a little bit from that plant, and then all of the plants will continue to thrive and survive over time. And your garden will, your, your plants will last so much longer that way. So you can step back and be um, a much more relaxed gardener. You're not having to sort of plant and pull and, and you know, re, redo bits of gardens all the time. It's just more of this snipping along as you go. And carry a little basket or a bag or something and just get a bit of this and a bit of that, a snip of that. And when you look at the plant, this is something that the local um, indigenous elder told me that you sort of step back first and you look at the shape of the plant and you think, OK, if I'm going to snip a bit off this plant, which is the bit that looks like it's going to help either bring extra form and shape to this plant or it's not going to damage its form and make it sort of fall over or if I pull this bit out, it's not going to damage the roots. So being really thoughtful and respectful of the plant as you go to to harvest from it. Another key thing about a forage garden is about being responsive. So the garden informs the meals rather than thinking, OK, so I have this recipe and I want to go and I get those particular vegetables to make this recipe. You flip that and you go, OK, let's go and see what's happening this season. What's looking really great today in the garden? What is looking that it's thriving and it has a lot of abundance and I can take um, more from that. And then that gives the indication of, of what it is that's going to be a beautiful meal for the day. Uh, so so this responsiveness to change with the seasons, to change even with the weeks and to to shift and change around that. I also think a forage garden helps us to be really active around the big picture. And so we call it this within, um, particularly within the perma youth movement, they call themselves practivists. And so it's really looking at how, how you can, through your positive, practical action in the garden, become um, activists for the common good. So it's looking about how can we create resilient systems that are healthy human habitats that produce an abundance of good food and are helping to regenerate not only the soils, but the ecological systems uh, in which we're dwelling. So this is a lot of what we talk about within our Permaculture Educators program. And I know many of you who are here are, are part of that program. And um, it'd be great if you toss some comments in, in the chat if you're here now. Because this, this is, to me, is one of the most important parts of what permaculture is all about, is thinking about how we can design our own systems in a way that is supportive of our health, supportive of our family health, supportive of ecological health, supportive of, of soil health, and that we do this in a way that then we can demonstrate and share this with other people to help ripple out this knowledge and understanding as far and wide as possible. And that essentially is what, what the Permaculture Education Institute is all about. That's, that's our mandate. And also in order to support this deepening of understanding about the, the many different perspectives of how perma, permaculture relates to education, permaculture relates to community, to storytelling, to youth, to to spirituality, to science, to fiction, to all different dimensions. I go out and I talk with different people um, who are ins inspirational people and activists in all different fields to explore the intersection between permaculture and their way of thinking or their particular, particular permaculture way of thinking. So this is a weekly podcast. So as well as these monthly masterclasses um, that are available, um, I encourage you to dive into the world of the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast, which um, I can also put a link in the chat. Or if you're listening to this later, I'll pop it down in the um, in the show notes below, because uh, there is we're now up to, gosh, episode 40 something. So there's a huge amount of resources there to, to dive into. Also, I have a blog. And you may, you may or may not have seen this. And I wanted to let you know because there's about 400 articles that are available in here that are all about different sorts of ways of growing, all different sorts of foods. There's links to so many different um, practical tips of how you can grow and use 
all different sorts of plants that you could grow in your forage garden. So that's our permaculturelife.com. And I encourage you to subscribe. You have a look on the top bar there. You can see the button to subscribe. And that way um, I'll, I can send you information about um, any updates or um, new films that have come out, new podcasts that have come out, uh, you know, free events that are happening just to keep you in touch with, with what's going on in this whole world of our permaculture life and forage gardening. Uh, also have a, a, a YouTube channel. And you can find on that too a couple of hundred films about all of these different sorts of things that will support you to create a beautiful forage garden. So you can find that at um, Morag Gamble, Our Permaculture Life, when you search up YouTube. And also, if you have people in your life that are youth under 25, typically the main age for this group is sort of somewhere around the sort of 14 to 18 year old age group they have monthly festivals and they talk with amazing guests from around the world um, and they link in with refugee youth in Uganda and Kenya they're doing incredible music program photographic program um, there's poets there's um, gardeners there is an incredible wealth of inspiration and knowledge within this group of intergenerational connections, cross-cultural connections, and it's all done through the gift economy. And we have lots of different groups that are supporting um, this initiative now around the world. Uh, so yeah, check out permayouth.org and let other young people know too about this. Um, I'm really absolutely keen to make sure that anyone who is a young person who's interested can have the opportunity to access this knowledge, you know, because I think it's, this is essential knowledge that we need to know as we're growing up and it can help so much in helping to shape where we go in our lives too. So thank you for listening and being part of this session today. I hope it's been a useful session about thinking how you can integrate some of the ideas to create a forage garden in your place, whether that be your own backyard, whether it be integrating as much as you possibly can on even a veranda or a courtyard or maybe you work in a community garden or a school garden and you can think about how you could take it into that context too. So um, this session, as always, has been brought to you by the Permaculture Education Institute, um, our Permaculture Life, the Ethos Foundation, which is our registered charity, which supports this year already um, over 500 young people in refugee settlements um, to, to access full and free permaculture education and of course also um, Perma Youth, the global permaculture youth network that I mentioned before. So thank you and uh, if you're here now live um, I'm going to be staying around for some time to answer questions and if you're listening to this later on um, then as I said before please feel free to put your questions below. Thank you so much for joining me and I would love to hear stories about how your forage garden is going or how your forage garden develops over time. Take care everyone.